Today is a Star Wars author interview, and I think this is the first time Jason's joined me for any of these type of interviews, right? Um, possibly. I think I was with you for one of the non-authors, and that's... Yeah, for Natalie Cox. Was, was that, I think that was somebody else as well, but yes, too many now. I've done too many episodes with you, so now I'm just I'm stuck forever with you. <laughs> but you've always loved to hear our authors, and now I've, you, know, you, you can be on for this one. And uh, why don't you introduce who we have on for this show? Well, um, we've got a guest who's been involved from um, the the oldest of the old to the newest of the new. Um, somebody who wrote some of the old, very old Republic, um, including Lost Tribe, of the, Lost, Lost Tribe of the Sith and Knights of the Old Republic um, through Knight Errant. Um, wrote one of the most recent and most popular books, uh, Star Wars Kenobi, um, and then is writing the first of the new canon, um, the, the the story group approved uh, a new dawn, which um, looks to be a, a very exciting um, project um, that, that feeds into the Star Wars Rebels TV show that comes out this this autumn. Um, so uh, yeah, we've got Don Jackson Miller, and uh, it's going to be very exciting. And he's also worked in comics galore. Yeah, absolutely, loads of uh, other stuff as well. He studies comics and game film literature. So I think since he has so much to talk about, we should probably go straight on to the interview that we have with Star Wars and Dark Horse and Marvel and, well, I guess DC probably, too, writer John Jackson Miller. We're going to start off with the the big question, because there's only so much you can talk about it, but it's the one that a lot of people are going to have questions about. Okay. So, um, you're writing uh, New Dawn, mm-hmm. the first uh, official canon novel in um, in Star Wars. I guess the question that we want to ask is, how did you feel when they contacted you to write this uh, th- this book and they told you it was the first official canon? Was it intimidating to, to establish a new canon for Star Wars? Well, it didn't work like that, first of all. Uh, and it's it's important to go back and you know look at what was in that press release that came out a few weeks ago and what it actually says. Uh, what is happening now is that Books are being uh, written with the consultation and cooperation of the Lucasfilm Story Group. Uh, This is a group of people at uh, Lucasfilm that uh, it allows the folks from, uh, you know, the movie side and the TV side and the fiction side to interact and coordinate on things. Uh, What this book specifically is, it's the first book in the uh, in the literature line uh, that was you know, created from the beginning uh, with this Lucasfilm story group where I, you know, I worked with uh, you know, the executive producers uh, at the, you know, the Rebels TV series to make sure that what I was doing in A New Dawn uh, connected up properly with what they're doing in the Rebels TV series. Uh, you know the the actual you know details about uh, you know what would be happening to uh, you know the other stories uh, I did not know about uh, until later in the process. Uh, it, you know all I knew was that uh, you know I was working with uh, the Lucasfilm Story Group from the beginning, and you know the the you know the you know, bigger picture things. Uh, that came about later on down the line, uh, after I was already well underway. So just just to just to clarify on on the old canon, then is to the best of your knowledge, is it literally a separate canon entirely that just sort of it is, isn't a thing anymore, or is it that they might bring some of it back into the the main canon? Because obviously we've had very little <laughs> in well, official words on all. It, of well, again, all I can do is tell people to go back to that press release because that's all I can you know all I can say and all I can go from myself uh, as yeah. far as as far as telling you the what it says is that the EU is not being discarded. It actually is being used for background information, inspiration for those people who are writing uh, stories currently. Uh, for example, uh, you know, Pablo Hidalgo, I think in, in one of the quotes in there, gives the example that, uh, you know, a number of corporations whose origins go back to, you know, when they appeared back in the old 
uh, you know, West End, uh, you know, game uh, role playing game series, uh, that the names of those corporations are actually appearing uh, in, you know, Rebels. Uh, you know, there there are a number of facts that uh, you know you can say were drawn from the previous material. Uh, I I think that the thing to keep in mind here is that. Uh, you know, everything that's passed is under this new Legends banner as far as reprint purposes are concerned, and it all exists uh, as material for, uh, you know, the, the various creators of the various series to draw ideas from, uh, and n I don't know whether they're ruling out doing more with it than that or not. That That's not really my... Uh, department to you know answer, and I don't have that information anyway. I, I think w the purpose and the importance of what they were doing here is simply, you know, there's a lot of new material that's going to be coming in from these new movies, uh, and they needed to make sure that the creators of those pictures uh, and uh, you know the people that are going to be developing things going forward uh, had as much running room as they possibly could have. Uh, to make the best films that they possibly could, and to, and to make sure that all of the attendant stuff that's going to come out, the TV series and the books and everything else, you know, also uh, you know has uh, as much latitude as it can possibly have. Uh, so uh, again, you know, I, I think it is perfectly reasonable to you know look at what has changed as not being necessarily that much of a change uh, until such time as. Uh, you know, you see, you know, that the the actual new continuity is different. Uh, and as I've said before, I, I don't think there's anything wrong at all uh, with, you know, tweaking these things uh, over time, uh, because I, I know that in developing a shared universe, I, I, you know, I come from the comic book side of things. So we, we've been doing this for years and years and years. Uh, you know, I go back before Crisis on Infinite Earths over at DC. Uh, so I've, I've had, I've had, uh, you know, I've got, I think I counted up, uh, I have something like 10,400 DC comic books that are no longer in continuity. Uh, am I keeping those comic books? You bet. Uh, if I ever uh, have the opportunity to write for DC, will I continue to draw ideas and inspirations from them? Will they? Will that material be my guiding star as far as you know what I would do? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I all the books are still on my shelf. All the books uh, that I ever use for Star Wars for reference, they're all still on my shelf. It's simply not going to be the case, though that the existence of uh, a, a book like Star Wars Kenobi would be uh, a roadblock to doing something else in that time period with that character in that position uh, should they find a, a reason to do it. So, so when you were writing A New Dawn, did you use any of the sort of older you, some of the books on your shelf um, as, as content? So will we find anything that we'll recognize as not being part of the films and and, and uh, Clone Wars and so on that, that we will know from um, the old expanded universe? Um, you know, I, or were I'm, you very t tightly kept by the story group onto the, the mainstream things? I, I'm not even sure I would be able to tell you by reading the book <laughs> uh, because it's all so ingrained. And the question is, well, what things came from the movies and what things came from outside? Uh, the physical dimensions of a Star Destroyer, for example, uh, that's one of those things where uh, yeah, I, it is something that I, you know, referred to and kept track of. But where did that fact come from? Did that fact come from, you know, one of the, you know, guidebooks that I, I did have and was referring to 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 get that information? Uh, but where where was that fact original? You know, the complement of uh, Tie Fighters aboard a Star Destroyer. Uh, you know, that's something which, uh, you know, I drew from as well. Where did that fact come from? Uh, it might have come from the movies. It might have come from West End doing a, a guidebook. It might have come from Starships of the Galaxy, which was the uh, the book that uh, Wizards of the Coast did. It might have come from one of the many uh, Dorling Kindersley uh, DK Press books. Uh, it might have been mentioned first in fiction. Uh, you know, there's a, there's going to be a, a real. I know it's going to be a fun parlor game for people to play. Uh, you know, as they go through books and see, well, gee, uh, did this source here or there or wherever? 
uh, you know, the absolute fact that has been said and is in these is in the press release is that you know the source material that that is is uh, you know the big uh, you know, the, the source material that is is the big guiding star is the six movies uh, and then I think they also mentioned the the animated series uh, and I I think the, the the more important thing is not to say oh gosh. Uh, well, since you know this this writer mentioned this particular fact, uh, that officially makes this other series part of uh, continuity. I wouldn't go that way. That way lies madness. <laughs> but the fact is is now kind of that that specific fact would be. But the but the fact would be absolutely. Yeah, you, know, you know, I I'm reminded of. Uh, you know, Dwayne McDuffie, uh, uh, the late comic book writer who came up with the uh, – he came up with a theory that said that all of the various television programs are actually part of the same universe because of this crossover here and that crossover there and this crossover here and that crossover there. Uh, and, of course, there are so many of them. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's a, as I say, it's a fun parlor game, but for actual purposes of, you know, writing, uh, you know, I, I don't think – I ever approach anything saying, okay, uh, because I've added this particular fact and it came from source X, uh, that means that, that source X has been added to the, the, the canon or something like that. I just don't think about it that way, and I don't think any of the other writers involved are thinking about these things this way. Uh, I, I think we're all completely on board with uh, you know, what has, has been set out as the, the ground rules here. Uh, and that's what's in that press release. That press release is, uh, you know, it's more than a, a more than simply a, a public communication. It is, you know, it lays out the, uh, you know, the sort of the rules of the road. So I guess last question about New Dawn, just so we can talk about lots of other stuff as well. Um, what was it like writing in the Star Wars Rebels timeline? The Star Wars, you know, something that's never been touched before, something we've never seen or even heard of. What was it like touching something completely? New. Well, I tell you, it was great for me because uh, I have never written anything uh, any farther forward in the timeline uh, than Kenobi, uh, with the exception of the very first Star Wars story I ever did, which was uh, a uh, an issue of Star Wars Empire. That was a Darth Vader story that was set in between uh, you know, episodes three and four. Uh, you know, that's almost ten years ago. Uh, I have not had the chance to do anything involving. Now, I've never written a Tie Fighter before. <laughs> I mean, this is this is uh, this is uh, this is something where uh, you know, it is a thrill to be able to uh, to do this. Uh, you know, I, I think there was the, the Darth Vader story uh, took place after uh, Episode Three, the uh, or after, after after Episode Four, uh, and I also did in the Dark Times era a uh, role-playing supplement for Wizards of the Coast uh, called Sword of the Empire, which uh, took place in between episodes three and four, and, and it actually included an Inquisitor, which, uh, and again, that's, that's an example of things that have been sourced from the past. The Inquisitor uh, is the name of a, a character that appears in Rebels. The idea of the Inquisitors, though, uh, comes back from the role-playing games. Uh, and 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 other materials, uh, you know, I think that uh, that that is a good example of how uh, you know how the you know some ideas have been able to filter forth and inspire the future. Excellent. That's it. That, that's more than I would have asked for. Excellent. I'm having um, one more question on the new dawn before you let me move on. Oh, sure. Okay. Because you you won't say no to me, Jeremiah. <laughs> Okay. Go. Um, which is um, obviously it's it's a prequel for Rebels. Now I, I know that um, that Wikipedia um, and particularly Wikipedia, how, how reliable they are, I don't know. But it, it says that the book set several years before the series. Um, uh, that, that is that is true. I think we've said that much. Uh, it is it is not strictly entirely a, a prequel uh, to the Rebel series because. Uh, it is, uh, and certainly as as I realized uh, that it would have this role in uh, you know, in the Star Wars, uh, you know, you know, not I, I don't even want to get into canon here, but uh, since I knew it would be an introductory piece for a lot of people, uh, 
uh, since you know we're now what you know almost ten years on from uh, from episode three, I really did try to make it an introduction uh, to you know what's going on in the Star Wars universe in this time frame as well. So it is yes, it certainly is uh, situated before Rebels. It certainly does have characters uh, you know as as we can see from the cover uh, from Rebels, uh, but it is more than I think simply. Uh, you know, an appendage to that. That is that you know that that wasn't how I was approaching it in the beginning, uh, and certainly uh, it is not how I think it uh, it came out. Uh, it is designed to be uh, the first book that uh, you know someone looking to get into uh, Star Wars literature might read. Cool. Um, my my question is that the the characters that you're using that are also in Rebels. Um, are quite young characters, really, and they look a similar age. So I was just curious as to what, what age are they, because I can't find any source on it, and, uh, and sort of how, how long before Rebels does, does you your book take place. <laughs> if you can't find a source on it, I can't be your source. <laughs> I, Fair enough. I, uh, you know, that is something which is uh, up to the, uh, the crew of uh, Rebels to reveal, uh, if it's not revealed in my book, and if it's revealed in my book, I can't reveal it here. So there you go. <laughs> okay. okay, fair enough. Um, so this is a, a question from a listener, uh, Judah Dashiell, who says, um, before the new changes are made with the canon timeline, how difficult was it to not contradict yourself? Take Kenobi, for example. You pulled information from a series written by Jude Watson. Was it a challenge to write in existing frameworks like that? Well, I'm an old hand at doing that. Uh, you know, I my first work was with uh, Marvel uh, writing uh, stuff for Iron Man's continuity, where you know Iron Man was already 40 years on at that point. So uh, there was quite a lot going on there. It happened to be that I had read almost all of it, which is hard to imagine uh, that much material. Uh, so I I was able to draw material from from everything. Uh, you know, Star Wars again. Uh, you know, we we have this wonderful resource at Lucasfilm where they're able to you know point us uh, to other things that have uh, you know been out there in the past. And of course, also you know the fans have their their own uh, you know resources that they've developed, Wikipedia and things like that, that uh, often point me in the right direction of of what to look at. Uh, you know, it wasn't a big problem with a lot of the work that I did simply because uh, there, uh, you know, I was doing a lot of stuff set in the very distant past, uh, Knights of the Old Republic, Lost Tribe of the Sith, uh, Knight Errant. Uh, there was not a whole lot of material that was already set in those time frames to run into, and what was out there, you know, there were, there were already detailed resources for. Uh, you know, it does get a little more complicated or did get more complicated with, uh, with Kenobi. Uh, simply because, you know, there were all sorts of different, uh, you know, works in different media uh, that had been written about uh, Obi-Wan in that time. Uh, you know, there were, you know, comics that referred to it. There were, uh, you know, uh, as you said, Jude Watson's books. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, writer Wyndham had put it all together in a uh, scholastic uh, you know, novelization or sort of a, a sort of a, an adaptation of all of the stories together, uh, Life and Legend of Obi-Wan Kenobi. So, uh, you know, there, there were a lot of things that I could draw from to sort of knit all that together. Uh, and, uh, of course, the interesting thing about Kenobi is you know, I had written the original plot for it seven years before the book came out. Uh, and in the time between when I shelved that story uh, and took it up again, a number of things had come along that I needed to check on uh, to see what had happened in the interim. Uh, but yeah, it, it, is, uh, it is a thing where, you know, it's just part of the, uh, you know, the due diligence, as it were, the part of the groundwork that you have to do when you're working in a universe like this. Uh, you just have to make sure you, you know what else is out there. And, you know, I certainly think that uh, it'll continue to be a, a situation going forward with the Lucasfilm Story Group where, you know, we're going to get assistance from Leland Chi and the rest of the team there uh, as far as, uh, you know, what's what's already established, what's out there, what we need to have reflected in our stories. So just a quick follow-up to that one. This is another listener question from Prelia Mantis. He's, um, to summarize his question, uh, is it daunting to try and – match another artist's or writer's vision when you try to when you want to make your own like when you're following up with a comic or a book in the same series is it really daunting to try to follow in the footsteps of previous artists writers and so on 
Well, I, I think that you know, I, I certainly wouldn't try to you know necessarily retell the story that somebody else told. Uh, because that story's already been told; it's already out there. You know, that's one of the reasons why I was never pushing to. You know, everybody always wanted to see an adaptation, comic book or otherwise, of uh, the events of the Knights of the Old Republic video game. I never, see, you know, saw the uh, saw the need to do that because that story was always already told, uh, and and told much better in, in that format than. You know, I think I would imagine doing in in uh, a different one. Uh, I, I think, though, what I do look for is the things that uh, you know I can elaborate on where it'll actually bring something to m the story that I'm telling right now. Uh, again, uh, it, for example, in Kenobi, one of the things that I looked at was the fact that there had been several other incidents in the past where. Uh, the uh, Sand People, the Tuscan Raiders, had taken in uh, you know other people from outside, and particularly other people from outside who had Jedi powers, uh, who had Force powers. Uh, there had been several episodes like that, and uh, that I took and made a springboard from. Uh, you know, when it were, came to you know uh, how they looked at Obi Wan Kenobi uh, moving into their neighborhood. Uh, that that gave me a hook, uh, those past stories on which I could uh, you know, build a new house on that foundation. Uh, so I, you know, I I definitely you know, I, I try not to you know retell any stories unless the retelling is part of the job, uh, as in the case of doing a, an adaptation of a movie or something like that. Uh, but I, I I look for ways to. Uh, you know, take things that can be used as springboards and we can, you know, make something new out of them. So we're going to go to some of your earlier stuff right a second, because um, you wrote the comics for Knight Errant, mm -hmm. and then you wrote the novel for Knight Errant, which takes place in between some of the stories. Was it a, was it a daunting to turn comic, your, your comic storyline into and insert a novel in there that, that fit well, it, it really wasn't a problem because in that case, I developed the both the novel story and the comic story, the first comic storyline, at the same time. Uh, and in fact, the the novel when it came out, it came out in between. Uh, well, it, it falls chronologically between the first volume of comics and the second volume of comics. Uh, but in in fact, in actual release. It came out between the fourth and fifth issues of the first comic series, just to show that we had already been, uh, you know, working on both of them simultaneously. So, uh, you know, I, it wasn't a difficult thing for me to know when I was writing that, okay, over here in this first comic storyline, a flame, uh, you know, I'm writing Kara Holt's origin story. This is how she got back to Sith space. Uh, and then I knew that what I was writing over in the novel over here was going to be our first really full-length adventure taking place in that time period. Uh, and, you know, then when I you know, came around to writing the second and the third volumes of the comic series, you know, I already had both the, the first comic storyline and the novel to look back on. Uh, so, yeah, it was, it, was not a, it was not a real difficult thing to, you know, figure out what went where. I just needed to make sure that what I had in the novel uh, covered the events of the first comic storyline in a way that both explains sort of why she was out there, but didn't give away that entire previous story. Um, you know, that's a, that's the work of a page maybe, uh, and maybe even a couple of paragraphs. Uh, and it's not necessarily that difficult. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's, that's what we, we always go through anyway is, uh, you know, when you start a story, you figure out exactly how much we need to tell people about what the situation is, the story until now. Uh, and uh, and that's uh, you know that's just part of any story that we would do. I don't really know how how much background they give you in your writing Star Wars comics and so on. What's the difference between working with uh, Del Rey and writing a Star Wars book, and working with Dark Horse and writing a Star Wars comic? Is there different levels of support? Is there a different background they give you? What what's the different uh, what's the difference between working with each since you've done both? Uh, you know, it's not really much different because when you're writing comics, you write a plot uh, that says what the entire storyline is going to be about, and that plot. Uh, goes through an approval process uh, at uh, the publisher and then goes through an approval process at Lucasfilm and uh, then it comes back and then you start writing the script. Uh, so there's not a lot of uh, difference between 
uh, you know, working uh, at the two places. Uh, it is true that, you know, when I started working at Dark Horse, you know, there was an actual document that said, okay, here's how things are spelled. Here's how things are capitalized. <laughs> you know, here's, uh, here's sort of the elements that, uh, that uh, you know, are common to all of the stories that we do. Uh, and it helped that I had those because, uh, you know, I was able to use that information when I went off next to do – I think the, the actual order of things, I, I, I did Star Wars comics first. Then I did Star Wars short fiction for the website. Then I did uh, Star Wars role-playing game material for Wizards of the Coast uh, all before I did my first Star Wars prose for Del Rey. And then that preceded the first Star Wars prose that I did for Star Wars Insider. So, uh, so uh, you know, you you, uh, you learn things at various places, and uh, you know you just carry those with you wherever you go. It sure sounds, like. and you definitely you know you started you've definitely covered almost everything that Star Wars has. Next, you discovered it was write a movie, and then you'll be set, and you have to cover well, it. you know, let's or see. a video game. <laughs> yeah, I need the video game people, the uh, you know the TV show people, and the movie people to get in front, get in touch with me. They know where I am. Uh, uh, no, there's there's a there's a there's so many different uh, you know ways that the Star Wars story is being told to people, uh, and it's being reinterpreted and is being elaborated upon. You know, I'm you know I'm working right now with the the prose side of things, and uh, you know it's it's uh, it's a blast writing this stuff, and you know certainly whatever the future holds, I, I'm uh, I'm interested in Star Wars for for life, so I, I certainly uh, you know would hope to be uh, you know continuing to produce things for folks in the future. So jumping uh, to another one of your series that are so far back that. You know, so far back in time that they, nothing can really contradict them. Um, Lost Tribe of the Sith. You know, it's your free um, short story collection, well, ebooks, short story collection about the Messassi and the Sith that you later see in, in later books and so on. Was it your choice or others' choices to make them free? Ah, oh, well, yeah, it was. Uh, it was entirely a uh, promotional product uh, project, rather by. Uh, the folks at uh, Del Rey, the idea was that since they had this nine-volume series of Fate of the Jedi novels coming out that starred the Lost Tribe of the Sith, they thought, well, wouldn't it be uh, interesting to do these short stories telling the backstory of the Lost Tribe? Uh, and I did, uh, I did those stories over the course of, I guess, two and a half years. Uh, they're all almost exactly the same length. Uh, they all came out, uh, you know, a week or so before each of the the novels released. All of them had a uh, sample chapter from the the novel to follow in it. Uh, but what happened over the of the course of it, uh, there were more than a million downloads of uh, those stories, and uh, it was you know it was great for helping me to get my name out there with the prose readers and you know, sort of get my feet wet. Uh, but it was also a, uh, a, a an example of how you know fans are really still interested in having the physical book. Uh, that was the number one thing that people asked the entire time we were doing those stories was when's the book coming out? Uh, when's when's the print version coming out? Even though the stories were free, uh, and so in uh, at the end of 2011 or middle of 2011, I was approached to. Uh, write a full-length uh, novella uh, with new material uh, to add to these other eight stories and put together into that Lost Tribe of the Sith trade paperback collection that we did. Uh, we also included my maps of the world that uh, that I had come up with. Uh, and again, that thing, I tell you, it sold through six printings, seven printings. I'm not sure what we're on right now, uh, but it, it did it did very well. And it really, you know, for somebody like me, you know, as a producer of stories, you know, I try to, you know, be, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't mind whether I'm writing for something electronic or a video game or a movie or a cartoon or a game or, or a, uh, a comic book or, or prose. You know, I, I try to be, uh, you know, uh, equal opportunity writer as far as that's concerned. As a reader, I certainly prefer having the physical books. Uh, and I was just delighted that there were, uh, you know, that many people interested in buying that. You know, it gives me something to sign when I'm at conventions. I certainly like to have that. 
<laughs> and you've been writing for, for obviously for, for a long while and on lots of different projects from um, one end to the to the other chronologically. Have, have you found them different in terms of how easy and, and difficult they are to write? Have you found that it was easier to write at the start or easier to write more recently once you ease into it? How's it changed? Well, they're all different kinds of stories. That's one of the strengths of the the you know having this long timeline with this universe where there's just a lot of a lot of real estate uh that's out there. You can tell different kinds of stories. The Lost Tribe of the Sith stories, you know, they're really sword and sorcery stories. They're really, you know, well or or dark side sorcery and lightsaber stories if you want to put it like that. Uh you know, the kinds of tales that we're telling there, there's you know, there are no uh space battles or anything like that. Uh it's it's much more a sort of a you know, more of a traditional fantasy story uh, that we're telling there, uh, you know, about what's going on on a on a planet like that with uh, you know with uh, with no technology. Uh, again, the the stuff that we did in uh, you know the Night Errant, that's a much different uh, you know timeline because that or part of the time that's a much different kind of story because. You know, there we have a a, a, a character who's uh, running around in an area that's already under occupation, and there is absolutely no hope for anybody that's there. Uh, so it's a it's a you know it's something that has some echoes of the imperial time period, but the the major difference there is, for example. Uh, yeah, I would really say that the people that are running around fighting each other in in the uh, in the in the Night Errant era, you know, that's that's really much more of a chaotic evil thing going on there. Whereas with the Empire, it's much more of a lawful evil kind of a society. You you really have this totalitarian structure, uh, you know, that's 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 there in the Empire that you don't see in Night Errant because Night Errant it's chaos. Night Errant is uh, you know, warring factions tearing each other apart. Uh, there's really a different feeling to that kind of a story. Uh, and then again, Knight, uh, Knights of the Old Republic. You know, we didn't have any Sith. Uh, we we this was a this was a, about a completely different kind of a war with the Mandalorians. Uh, and it was a period where uh, you know the the Jedi and the Republic. Uh, you know, it was sort of the, you know, the, you know, it wasn't the dark ages for their culture at all. It was, uh, you know, things were running really well, uh, but uh, well enough that, uh, you know, we could have a, a kind of a scandal like we had that kicked off the Knights of the Old Republic storyline. Uh, and, you know, that, that could be that could be something that would uh, disrupt, uh, you know, someone's life. Uh, you know, it, being a fugitive uh as Zane Carrick was, uh, means more in the Knights of the Old Republic timeline, uh, or, or it means more in a Knights of the Old Republic style world than it would mean if Zane Carrick were a fugitive in the Knight Errant frame, uh, because no one in Knight Errant cares about enforcing the law. Uh, <laughs> Zane would be a fugitive, but he would be a fugitive from Sith Lords running around. He would not be a fugitive <laughs> from the Republic and the Jedi. Uh, it, mm. it, again, each thing just allows you to tell different kinds of stories, uh, and I think that's a real strength of the Star Wars license. So speaking of Star Wars license, probably the most famous Star Wars book you wrote, at least as far as the general fan base goes, is Kenobi. Uh, which is a uh, we've we've talked about it a little bit. You know, it's a fairly short in scope film um, story, but very but a fairly important one as well. Uh, how much uh, I should say when you when you were approaching Kenobi, how hard was it to get into the head of such a memorable character that's been portrayed by so many great actors? Well, I certainly you know had watched uh, the movies and I, I watched the you know the uh, the portrayal that Ewan McGregor did, uh, and I. I you know, had certainly uh, knew how that character turned out uh, because I I knew you know what happened in episode four. Uh, I what I tried to do is just put myself into his uh, into his manner of thinking and say, well, what what would he be doing at this point in time? What would he be thinking at this point in time? Uh, it's not necessarily the case that when he goes to Tatooine. He would know. Well, I'm going to be here for the rest of my life. Uh, he doesn't know. Uh, he he, as far as he knows, uh, 
you know, yes, he could be there forever and ever, but uh, you know, they're he's so isolated. You, you know, maybe Palpatine will uh, you know, choke on a walnut or something like that, and he'll be dead by the end of the uh, first year. Who knows? Uh, it, it's it's uh, it, it's simply the case uh, that. Uh, you know, he's he has to prepare for the worst. He has to expect that, uh, you know, he can't just, you know, hide out in an apartment on Coruscant with a little baby in the back of the of the apartment, uh, you know, hoping that, uh, you know, things will change overnight. He knows that he's not going to be part of things changing uh, in this interim period anyway. Uh, but I, I, I did want to, you know, show that, okay, he is arriving in this place ready to be there for the long haul, expecting that he's going to need to get this place where he's living cleaned up for the long term. But he may not yet have really grappled with that, really come to terms with that thought. You know, oh, gosh, uh, you know, I'm going to need to I'm going to need to do X, Y and Z to be able to live here for a long time. And if I want to live here for a long time, here are the things I'm not going to be able to do again. Here are the things I'm not going to be able to allow myself. Uh, you know, I'm not going to be able to have the friendship of the locals uh, necessarily uh, if I want to be able to, you know, play the role that I have to play. Now, there's, um, I've got a question, which, which is, when we read through the book Kenobi, um, we obviously read it in Kenobi's voice. It's it's one of those those voices that is ingrained the same way that any comment by Samuel L. Jackson or uh, Liam Neeson or anybody else, um, you always read it in their voice. So presumably, whilst you were whilst you were writing, um, you had Obi Wan's voice recurring from from the start of writing to the end of writing. Um, now we've had James Arnold Taylor on the show, and he did a very, very good, obviously Kenobi. I was Absolutely. just curious as to how good yours was. Oh, my, mine's very bad, and I'm I'm not going to do it again. But I I used I used to do a Jimmy Stewart Obi Wan Kenobi impression, and I'm just I'm avoiding that now because nobody remembers who Jimmy Stewart is, sadly. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I have I have uh, I have. I have zero talent for acting. I have zero talent for voices uh, other than in my own head. And so uh, I'm, I'm delighted that we had in not just, uh, not just, uh, you know, we, we, we had the, we had James's wonderful, uh, you know, clip that he did of it promotionally. Uh, but we also had, uh, you know, the wonderful audio book that was produced. Uh, and I, I think that that was, that was something where, uh, having uh, you know, various different people doing their versions of him uh, just made it all sort of real in my mind uh, that you know it, it, it's this was my first time to actually have an audiobook done and it really right. you know, my my kids love listening to it. Uh, it they they always insist on it when we're in the car uh, and uh, I, I think that they they're going to insist that we take a long vacation so that we can finally get through the last chapter. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yes. but yeah, I, you know, Jonathan, who did the uh, the uh, the the audio book, I think did a wonderful job. And uh, you know, I I certainly I, I recommend that audio book from from Delray Audio for anybody who hasn't heard it yet. Yeah, I'm, I'm halfway through it at the moment, and, and I'd recommend it as well. It's it's very well done. Although all the other Star Wars um, audio books I've I've listened to as well have all been excellent. They they do a very good job with the voices and a very good job with the sound effects and stuff. Um, we're sponsored by Audible still, right, Jeremiah? <laughs> so uh, yep, yes, we still are. People yeah. can head to audible.com from our website. We'll chuck a link into this this episode Ab as well if people want to, to bounce through to Kenobi. Absolutely, that's that's great. I I love that story. The 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 you know the recording of it. That's wonderful. Mm. So our last segment, we've, we have some minutes left, but we wanted to talk about one that, something that's obviously one of your huge passions, that being comics. Mm -hmm. You have your Sword of Sarcasm, you have your Comicron page, you've written a lot of Star Wars comics, you've written Mass Effect comics. Um, I want to see some Robert Howard stuff recently, too. Yeah, I did a, I did a Conan story for uh, the Robert E. Howard's uh, Savage Sword series that uh, Dark Horse does. That's a, actually the most recent comic story I have out. Is uh, it, That came out from Dark Horse this past fall. So being that comics is obviously your, your main passion, does it feel weird to be writing books now? Does it, is it drawing you away from, from comics, or are you still keeping just as much up on comics now that you're writing books um, well, as well? Well, I, you know, 
I started uh, you know, in this business writing uh, or on the fiction side of this business. I started writing you know comics and graphic novels, and over the last uh, really three years, uh, you know, prose has taken a little bit more of my year, and then a little more and a little more. Uh, you know, part of it was situational, just because we had. Uh, over at Dark Horse, you know, they were coming to the end of their license, so they weren't going to be able to take any new material uh, for Star Wars. I also ended up getting, uh, you know, several, uh, you know, prose uh, assignments. Uh, you know, Kenobi was one, A New Dawn was another. Uh, I also did my own uh, fiction piece uh, called Overdraft, which uh, folks can find on my uh, – uh, they can find it at Amazon or their, their bookstore uh, website. Uh, or at my website, which is farawaypress.com. Uh, and uh, then, of course, earlier this year, I did my first uh, Star Trek novella uh, uh, for the uh, Star Trek Titan series uh, uh, called uh, Absent Enemies. Uh, and, in fact, what I'm working on right now is yet more prose. Uh, I, am, I am writing my first full-length Star Trek novel, uh, which uh, is for the Star Trek The Next Generation line, uh, that comes out uh, in 2015. We haven't given any details about that yet, uh, but you know, it, it just sort of happened this way that it, this ended up being more of a, uh, a prose sort of a time for me. But I am still keeping you know tabs on and still keeping involved in uh, the comic side. Uh, you mentioned Comicron. Comicron is uh, my uh, Comics Chronicles is the the, you know, the full name of it. It is uh, it is my comics history website. This goes back to uh, you know 20 years ago. I started in this business as the editor for the trade magazine of the comics industry, uh, and I had that role for about 10 years, uh, writing some books about comics along the way. Uh, when I started writing fiction and comics full time, I continued to write that uh, that material. I continued to uh, compile that material for my own website. Uh, and now it is the world's largest repository of sales figures for American comic books. Uh, you know, I have sales figures from every month going back to 1995, 96. I have uh, sales figures uh, from various years going back. You know, uh, I, you know, I have some rankings going back to the 1960s, and then I have uh, just other articles on the site taking comics all the way back to where they. They really started in the United States, 1935, 36, 37. Uh, so it, it's it's really more of a hobby pursuit for me now. Uh, you know this this history about the business uh, and and about what uh, you know what came out when and and how well it sold and how things have changed over the years, such as where comics are sold and how comics are priced. Uh, but it's also something that I keep uh, fairly current. I mean, this past week. Uh, we just had uh, the you know, second relaunch of the Amazing Spider-Man series from Marvel. Uh, that uh, series, uh, the first issue of it, uh, you know, I, I released the estimates on Monday that it sold 300. Uh, sold, I'm sorry, 532,000 copies uh, in North America, uh, which makes it the best-selling comic book since uh well uh, the the pokemon series in 1999 if we're looking at uh, not just the the comic shops but but all locations uh that series sold over a million copies per issue uh and if we're just looking in the uh in the comic shops uh you if you want to go back to the last comic book that sold a million copies you'd have to go back to uh, I think Batman issue 500 back in 1993. Well, 1993 was when I started tracking this stuff, so I I kind of have this uh, this perspective on this, and I, I I've been doing it for enough years that uh, you know people are are following it. I I really was just you know dumbfounded on Friday uh, when we did this uh, you know this this report that came out. Uh, you know about Spider-Man you know, being the bestseller of the 21st century. Uh, you know, I that blog post had more than 20,000 views in a 24-hour period. Uh, certainly, the record for for my website. Uh, but it, what it tells me is that you know comics, uh, you know, far from being a, a market or industry in decline, uh, the numbers don't show that. Uh, but also. Uh, you know that many people are interested in buying a comic book, the comic book, but also that many people are interested in reading about how well it did. <laughs> that that to me is a sign of a uh, you know a healthy market, 
And, uh, you know, comics have always been part of my life. And you know, even though, uh, you know, I, I think actually this year may end up being the, the first year in probably, you know, a dozen years that I, I don't have any comics that are going to be coming out. Uh, I certainly will be, uh, you know, doing more in the future. It's just a matter of getting the right project at the right time. Uh, you know, and there are, there are a few concepts that I've been working on uh, in the meantime anyway. But, uh, you know, I don't think I will ever be gone from comics for long. So that's a quick question about comics. So this is one I've always, you know, been curious about, and you're the expert on this one. Um, is it true that Death of Superman is the number one selling comic of all time? No, the uh, that, that's a that's a good guess. Uh, it's in the top five. Uh, the and a, and actually, it wouldn't be the death of Superman issue. It would it, it, uh, alone that you need to put on that list because uh, that was back when people uh, didn't necessarily know how big a deal it was going to be. The really big month in the business was April of the following year when Superman came back. Uh, that, that was the year where we sold over forty five million comic books uh, in, in one month. Uh, that was you know, the high point of the, the business, even if you count the, the old days, uh, you know, the golden age uh, of comics, you know, 45 million uh, you know, comics, uh, that, is, that, is, that is more than we sell today in eight months. Uh, so I mean, that's quite a lot. Uh, the the actual uh, number one comic book and uh, the, the the Guinness Book of World Records. Uh, I've I've been in contact with those folks, and they uh, they use my numbers on this uh, in their addition to uh, to establish this. Uh, the best selling uh, comic book to ever come out in the English language uh, is X Men Volume One or Volume Two Number One. That was the relaunch of the X Men series uh, that came in uh, the summer of 1991. Marvel did five different covers for it over the course of five weeks, and it sold over 8 million copies. Um, it is also, if you just go by the, the you know, scarcity uh, index, the least collectible comic book of all time. <laughs> I, have, I have 25 copies of this thing, and I don't know where they came from. I didn't buy them all. They just sort of drift in whenever I would you know, end up with taking over somebody else's collection. Uh, it is, uh, it is a, a, a symbol of what was going on in the early 90s that did include – uh, the death of Superman, uh, yeah, the death of Superman and and the uh, you know the the return of Superman really was sort of the high water mark of uh, you know the craziness back then. Uh, but the bubble burst later on that year, uh, and as I've said, there hasn't been a million copy seller in the comic shops uh, since that 500th issue of Batman uh, that we got in the uh, the fall of uh, 1993. Uh, could it happen again, though, one day? It's certainly possible. It's all a matter of uh, really how many comic shops there are. The, the number one thing that really controls how many comics uh, you know, are sold, what the ceiling is, is how many venues there are selling them. Uh, and, you know, back then, uh, you know, part of what caused the bubble in comics was we we had a credit bubble, much like the like the housing market. Uh, we had a, a a bubble for uh, the uh, establishment of comic shops uh, in North America. We had 12 different distributors as opposed to the one that we have now uh, that were selling comic books to comic stores, uh, and you know they were willing to in that period. Uh, open up competing stores across the street from each other in many cities, uh, and you know we went from having, you know, 3,000 comic shops to having more than 11,000 accounts uh, ordering comics over the course of about three years. That was not sustainable, uh, and uh, in fact, quite a lot of the comics that were purchased in that period, for example, that that X-Men issue did not go to individual readers, but were purchased by people who. Uh, either thought they could sell them in their stores and weren't able to, or people who bought them from their retailers and thought that they could resell them for a great profit and they weren't able to. Uh, it, it is an example of a madness that kind of took over in that period. Uh, I, I do know that there was one uh, store that reported that one of their customers ordered 5,000 copies of that X-Men issue back in 1991. Again, you know, how really rare can it be when there are 8 million copies of the book? Uh, this time around, 
it, it, I don't see that kind of danger happening because uh, the the number of comic shops is is much more regulated. Uh, Diamond being the only distributor uh, is a lot more uh, stringent in terms of what their you know rules are for opening a comic shop. You have to have a business plan. You have to have uh, you know various uh, you know things with your location and other things that guarantee that you're a uh, you know likely to be in business in a year or six years. Uh, but uh, you know, also we have the fact that uh, many of the comics that are now currently being ordered for, uh, you know, I, I think you might call it the speculators market or or the the back issue market. Uh, you know, there's a much better chance that those books are actually rare. Uh, what what did we not have in the early '90s? We didn't have eBay. We didn't have sources like my website that said how many copies existed out there, how scarce something really was, what the original print run of some of these things were. We've got that now. We've got that information. And the people that are trading uh, in these comic books as a, as a profit you know, thing, they're not going after the regular cover of the book that everybody else has a copy of. They're going after these very rare variants that you know, might only exist in – uh, you know, numbers of uh, 50 or 100 or 500, uh, where, you know, you can find out pretty quick how rare they really are just by going on your online websites and going on, uh, going on uh, you know, eBay and checking these things out. So, uh, you know, I think that comics are in a lot better shape than they were 20 years ago. Uh, we have three legs to the table now. It's not just the comic book, but it's also the graphic novel, the collected editions, and it's also the digital versions that are out as well. And uh, you know, I, I think that each one of these things makes it easier to you know look at comics and say, you know, we're going to be around in ten, twenty years. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that you know we've always been able to say it in comics. Uh, you know, comics have. Yeah, uh, Will Eisner once said that comics have nearly died three times, and you know each time we've you know miraculously come back from uh, the brink, just like a superhero. Uh, I, I think that uh, with any luck, we have learned some things from the past, uh, and uh, you know we may not have as many near-death experiences in the future. Excellent. So, to from my side wrapping up, I just have a couple of quick questions that. These ones should be answered in like a word or two. Or sure. Maybe a if, if, I, if I know how to do that, yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, first of all, this, this one is – I think this person wants to pick a fight with the comic book people. But who makes the best comics, Marvel, DC, or Dark Horse? Oh, you know, I, I have to absolutely uh, put up my hands and say I, I can't answer that one. I can't, <laughs> I, I, everybody. I'm in favor of – yeah, you know, a lot of people go to my website looking for you know ammunition to use in their argument. Marvel versus DC, Marvel versus whoever. Uh, I don't, I don't do a lot of horse race stuff on my website. I think the only race that we're in in comics is with our own past and with all the other things that comics are competing with to try and catch people's attention. Uh, you know, I I like the fact that. Uh, you know, right now we have the industry hitting on multiple cylinders. We have things going on uh, at all the publishers that people are interested in, uh, and that's really, I think, when when the market is strongest uh, is is when there's important stuff, good stuff happening. You know, it's it's not just when you have DC doing its new 52, but you also have. You know, you know, Marvel doing its new Marvel books and and you know, Image doing Walking Dead and Saga and various other things and Dark Horse that has you know Buffy out there and various other uh, you know projects that are you know attracting attention. That's I think what this business really needs is uh, you know as many uh, as many different publishers doing. Uh, things that are capturing people's attention as possible, and that was supposed to be a one-word answer, wasn't it? I, I should, I should be a politician. I'm sorry. Let's, let's see if this next one will be quick. Who is your favorite comic book character growing up? Uh, I think I was a big Spider-Man fan, uh, certainly uh, him and Iron Man, and I, I certainly was thrilled that I got to write Iron Man. Uh, it was, uh, it was, it was a blast uh, to get to write. Uh, to get to write him, and you know, I've I've had other uh, other favorites. Uh, you know, I was I was a big fan of Uncle Scrooge and those comics that were done by Carl Barks, uh, and those were probably the first comics that I read. Uh, and I've just had so many different favorites over the years, and uh, certainly Star Wars comics have always been a part of my life. And again, another big thrill to get to uh, to play in that sandbox. 
So uh, last of these quick ones, and then I have one question from a listener that I just forgot about. So uh, recent in recent years, which comic book series or run has gotten you most excited as a comic book fan? Well, I, I'll tell you, the, the thing with my business is I am so busy working on my own stuff that I haven't had a whole lot of time to, uh, you know, to read all the comics that have piled up. I, you know, one of the things that, that happened from being in the business for so many years is I got review copies from everybody <laughs> for, a whole, uh, for a whole long time, and it's taken years to get those integrated. Uh, my, my wife as well, uh, you know, she was the manager of a comic shop uh, before we got married, so uh, you know, I don't know that there was much of a dowry, but she brought all the DC comics that I didn't have to the marriage. Uh, that was... That was uh, – I have so much stuff that I need to read uh, and, and uh, uh, that, I, that I've been, I've been ready to, uh, to uh, you know, tear into, and it's just been waiting for me to get to. My, uh, my to-read pile is just you know, over the top of the house. It's, it's horrible. Uh, but, but certainly uh, – and one of the things that I do a lot of is I'll reread very old things. I'm, I'm in the middle of a reread of, uh, of Marvel's Doctor Strange, for example, uh, from, from the old days. Uh, and I mean the really old days, the Steve Ditko days. Uh, you know, that's the sort of thing that, uh, you know, I, you know, I, I do when I have a little time, uh, you know, just try to refresh my memory and catch up on. Uh, and you know, I, I certainly, uh, I love the fact that there's a whole lot of new things that are coming out that I'll be able to catch up on five years at a time. So this last listener question is apparently a two questions that he just didn't use punctuation and made it new. You know, one question. He asks, um, "Is there what comic book character do you think deserves a film that has not yet gotten one? And if you could reboot any franchise yourself canonically, which one would it be?" <laughs> well, let's see. Uh, as far as uh, as far as uh, you know, a character that hasn't gotten a film yet. Uh, as I just mentioned, Doctor Strange. I know he's getting a film. Uh, so I think that would be great to see. I'm also looking really forward to the Flash TV show that's coming out. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Flash at DC and also uh, you know, the Flash TV series that was on in the 90s. So I'm really looking forward to seeing that uh, and, and getting, out, getting that out there. I've always wanted to see a Dreadstar movie. Dreadstar is a series that Jim Starlin did for Marvel's epic line back in the 1980s. And, uh, and I've always thought that would just make a fantastic film. Uh, I, I'll be interested to see if that happens. Uh, and I'm sorry, what was the other question? <laughs> Is there, a, if you could uh, reboot a oh, franchise yeah. canonically, which one would it be? Oh yeah, the reboot. You know, that's that's the thing. Is uh, you know, I, 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 there there are a number of uh, franchises that I would like to write in, and I'm certainly uh, you know, comfortable with whatever the rules of the road are. Uh, you know, on whatever the thing is, I, you know, I, I have to say franchises that I haven't gotten to write for, uh, you know, I, I have some really, uh, you know, curious, uh, eclectic tastes on a lot of things. Uh, I would probably pay money to write a Max Headroom comic series uh, or, or novel set back in the uh, in the days of the old, uh, you know, not, not the talk show that uh, they did for it, but the you know the science fiction TV show that that BBC did uh, that uh, that aired over here uh, in uh, on on ABC uh, the the series that was set 20 minutes into the future and that you know, in which uh, you know, television networks controlled the uh, controlled the world. Uh, so many of the things in that series have come true <laughs> it's just I, I think it would be a lot of fun to to uh, to to uh, take another stab at that and it would still be 20 minutes into the future even even done now uh, <laughs> you know and, and as far as you know reboots I think everybody in whatever what and, and this applies to anything everybody kind of has their own continuity their own canon their own things that they look at where they say, okay, these are the these are the series that uh, these 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 are the these are the movies that I'm gonna pay attention to or that I'm I'm gonna feel are are real, and these are the ones that I'm not. Uh, for me, the movie Rocky Four never happened. Uh, <laughs> the movie Rocky Five never happened. Uh, 
the 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 uh you know i i i'm 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 not happy with aliens 3 and what it did to aliens uh you know but that's that's everybody does that though we all have that that thing where we you know we these are the stories that we remember and these are the stories that we we don't uh and uh and so yeah i i think that uh you know, you know, everybody has their own personal canon. And I, I think it's kind of, you know, on, on anything, it's going to continue to be that way. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, I think the, the wonderful thing in the case of Star Wars is, you know, we have the involvement of everybody, uh, now, uh, at, at, uh, at Lucasfilm and the story group that it's, you know, it, that we, we do have everything, you know, sort of interlocking together and coming together from all different parts of the, uh, of the license, uh, I, I think that that's that's what it's making it, that's what's making it exciting to work in that one right now and uh, and you know certainly uh, you know when a new hope comes out I believe it's September second I'm sorry a new hope a new dawn huh, Freudian slip there uh, when, <laughs> when Star Wars a new dawn comes out uh, 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 the uh, the second of September yeah I, I really am hoping that uh, you know people will you know tune in and take a look at that book and uh, enjoy it because it is my first stab at this part part of the timeline and uh i think that it uh it was fun for me to write and i think it'll be fun for people to read okay jason you can ask your your last question and honestly i think you'd be able to write a really awesome moon knight story so uh, you know i i've thought about moonlight uh, moon knight if i'm going to write moon knight i might as well write batman uh because yeah, they're they are so similar i'll talk to you about jason, batman the, the, in the background you'll have heard um mr jeremiah's little baby bruce who, oh, yeah. uh, if you ever want to he write a comic a book about, <laughs> he's wearing a bat suit. Well, I, I saw I saw Batman in the theater twelve times. Uh, so that that's the Tim Burton Batman. So I have I have uh, even though I grew up as a Marvel reader, I do have the I do have the Batman and I do have the DC. Uh, you know, I, I I do have I have, I do have the DC stickers on my uh, passport there. <laughs> um, my, my question is, we've, we've had a, a lot of um, really interesting stuff for people who know tons about comic books and who, who delve into it all, but we've we'll also got loads of listeners who are new to comic books or, or maybe have only read one or two. So with your exhaustive knowledge of everything that has ever happened, if you had to recommend for people to buy a few copies to introduce them to comics, which um, storylines or which issues would you suggest people that are new start with? Okay. Yeah, uh, well, I, I would say, you know, for the younger reader, uh, you know, Bone from Jeff Smith, uh, and of course that's been collected by Scholastic, and so that's out there in a lot of different ways. You know, that is that is a tour de force, uh, that book. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, Carl Barks, to go back to him, his – uh, his uh, his Disney stories, his uh, his duck stories, again a great place for the younger reader to start, and of course those stories hold up for the older readers as well. Uh, you know, just really really good stuff. Um, you know, for uh, for the the superhero fan, yeah, obviously there are uh, you know there are, for each franchise you've got uh, the required reading story in in each of them. I think that uh, you know the the Dark Phoenix storyline and everything that comes up to it. Uh, developing it in in the X Men franchise, uh, you know I love the fact that uh, you know the the new X Men movie is going to be introducing people to uh, uh, you know the Days of Future Past story that uh, appeared in uh, in X Men uh, 141 142 I believe I can't remember the specific issues for sure I think that's what they are uh, but I, I love that it's it's going to be introducing people to that. You know, uh, Watchmen obviously was one of the was one of the major uh, you know things that's on everybody's reading list. Uh, Batman: The Dark Knight Returns that uh, that gives you that, and also Batman Year One, uh, which uh, you know sort of refreshed that character and renewed uh, you know Batman for uh, for the new generation uh, you know, that was coming along then. Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, there are also some other you know smaller uh, projects that. Uh, I think just really uh, are great introductions. Um, you know, there was a there was a you know, Roger Stern did with uh, Mike Mignola, I think it was a uh, a a Doctor Strange Doctor Doom crossover graphic novel that's just beautiful. Uh, it, and you know, it obviously that's a, that's crossing over two different parts of uh, you know that timeline and that history uh, uh, of those two characters. Uh, but yeah, I I think it's a it's a really great introduction to 
uh, you know, both those two characters and the worlds that they live in. Uh, and, you know, there, there are the other, you know, the, there's certainly many, many other graphic novels on things besides, you know, action adventure or besides superheroes that are, they're out there that, uh, you know, are, you know, turning up, thankfully they're turning up in, uh, in, you know, mass market booksellers and in libraries, uh, for people to read. Uh, look, this is a, this is a field that has generated a Pulitzer prize winning, you know, literature, uh, prize winning, uh, you know, novel in, uh, in the case of mouse. Uh, I, I think that, uh, by, uh, and, and I, I think there's other, uh, you know, weighty books like that that are out there that have been told in comics form. Uh, I'm I'm just really pleased that uh, you know we are now reaching a point where uh, you know every newspaper article 20 years ago. Well, let me go back even further. Every newspaper article about comics 40 years ago or 30 years ago, the headline started "Bow Piff Bam." People are still doing comics, uh, and then every every newspaper article 20 years ago was. Uh, you know, comics are in deep trouble. Comics are, you know, dying. Marvel is in bankruptcy. Stores are closing. Uh, will comics survive into the new century? I'm so happy that today's news articles, when I when I get called for them and when I see them appear, you know, they're written by people who are not surprised that comics still exist. They love comics. They they grew up reading them, uh, and they're enthusiastic about them. Uh, and so not every story is about how, uh, you know, uh, you know, comics are, are facing their death knell. We don't have that anymore. And we also uh, no longer have stories from people who look at comics as being only for children. You know, Biff, Pal, Bam. You don't see those except in really lazy headline writer stories. <laughs> That's that you, you don't see that. You don't see them recalling that anymore. We are now you know, almost 50 years on from the Batman TV series, so it's it's now something that we no longer even really resent like we did 25 years ago in comics. Uh, we now sort of embrace it with the Batman 1966 version that uh, that has just come out. Uh, we could actually accept that that was part of who we were at one point, and only a small part of who we were at one point, but it's no longer who we are, uh, and uh, – there we go. That's another very long answer to. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great because uh, there'll be loads of people listening who ask their best mate, "Oh, which comic book should I read?" And uh, you can't get a better answer from a better person than that. So um, I'm going to leave it to Jeremiah. But thank you very much. I think you've been definitely one of our best guests, and uh, we could talk for five hours. It would be amazing. So um, thank you. Well, I really appreciate uh, appreciate getting the chance to get on here. And uh, like I say, folks can find my stuff uh, farawaypress.com. I have a behind the scenes page on everything that I've ever done. Uh, my uh, Twitter account is JJM Faraway, uh, and uh, people can follow me there. I'm also on Facebook, just under John Jackson Miller. And then people can follow me on Facebook. And, I'm sorry, Facebook on on that Comic Chronicles website. That's comicron.com. C o m i c h r o n dot com. Uh, I am also on Twitter for that, uh, at Comicron, C-O-M-I-C-H-R-O-N. Excellent. Is there anything else that we haven't promoted yet that you'd like to promote? Um, <laughs> I think that's got it. Get? I think that's okay. got it. Uh, everybody go check out uh, everything that we've got coming up there. Thank you so much for this, and uh, I'm quite sure the next time we have you on will be about comics, because there's so much more we could talk about comics, and... Uh, well, not much time. Well, so I'm going to be, so gonna be bullying uh, Jeremiah to try and get you back on when Rebels and A New Dawn comes out um, and, uh, uh, you know, all of that stuff. I'm going to be begging I'm, him to <laughs> get you back on. I who to talk to to sort of that interview. So. All right. Well, thanks a lot, guys. Thank you so much, and have a great day. All right. You too. Yeah, thank you.